So my name is Anna Thompson, and I'll be presenting with... Hey, my name is Willmaker. <laughs> Excellent. So, so there are a couple of poll questions. Thank you for answering them. And we're going to end the poll now. And it looks like we had, uh, in the terms of where people stood in accessibility, uh, the majority seemed to be familiar with the basics, followed by intermediate in accessibility, and some new to accessibility. This is great. So we have quite a variety of people. And then the second question, it asked, um, what do you think the percentage of students in higher institutions uh, is who have at least one disability? So we had different choices, 10, 20, 30, or more than 30%. And uh, the majority selected 20%, and some 30 and some more than 30. The correct answer is more than 30, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Excellent. So we're going to start with some accessibility basics. And starting with the definition of accessibility. It means that individuals with disabilities are able to, on their own, get the same information, engage in the same interactions, uh, enjoy the same services within the same time frame as individuals without disabilities with equivalent ease of use. And this is a, a definition from the Office of Civil Rights. So why is that important? Accessibility makes content usable by everyone, not just people with disabilities. And students with disabilities don't have to wait to have materials converted. Besides, it is the right thing to do. Here's some disability data. So according to the CDC 2016 data, about 61.4 million of Americans report that they have some sort of disability. And according to the Center for Talent Innovation report in 2016, about 30% of professionals said that they have some sort of disability. So it's quite a lot more prevalent than we, than we think. And a lot of times those disabilities are the kind that we don't, we can't even tell that people are experiencing. And according to the uh, National Center for Educational Statistics, about 19.4% of our undergraduate students in higher institutions reported that they have a disability. Along with that, about 11.9% of graduate students also reported that they have a disability. Now, these numbers, we have to take in, keep in mind, they reflect students who self-identified and registered with the local disability office. In anecdotal data that I've acquired from conversing with many of my colleagues across several institutions, uh, they have agreed that the percentage of actual students with disabilities is between 30 and 35%. So we have a lot of different types of content that we share with our students. We have learning system management pages, like from whether you use Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard, or other, or other LMSs. Web pages from websites like WordPress, for example. Um, Office documents, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, Google Drive files, slides, docs, sheets. Links to resources, and this can be like library resources can be websites, PDFs sometimes, and things like videos, podcasts, and images. So in terms of uh, content that is text-based, the most accessible format is web pages. And that means, you know, web pages on a website or web pages, pages inside a learning management system as well. Uh, and those are followed by well-formatted Microsoft Office or Google Documents. In terms of PDFs, even though they are used all over the place, they are not as accessible. It takes a lot of extra work to make them accessible. So we always recommend that, like for library articles that have a permanent link, use the permanent link in 
in your uh, teaching content instead of uploading the PDFs to the content. This provides different types of formats and options. So in terms of, okay, so people with disabilities, how do they get navigate content in many different ways? The great majority of them, they do it with just the keyboard. Uh, University of Washington Duet Center has an initiative called nomouse.org if you'd like to check it out and take the no mouse challenge and see if you can navigate your content without using your mouse. So other ways that they can interact with a content are using screen readers, text-to-speech technologies, voice commands, and there's some other interfaces such as eye tracking, tongue drive system or TDS, pneumatic, which means they're, they're blowing air at, dif at different speeds and with different uh, pressures to control technology, or brain-computer interface, BCI. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about some of the specific tips we use to make our content accessible. So first up, I'm gonna talk about some document structure. And I'll start with headings. So the first step here is to use real headings to organize your content. So we add headings for a reason, right? Headings make content easier to navigate. Rather than looking at a wall of text, when we have headings, we can more easily find what we're looking for without expending too much energy searching. So what about people who don't see those headings? For example, people using screen readers to listen to the content. Well, users of screen readers can also use headings to scan and navigate the content of a page. For example, uh, screen readers allow users to listen to a list of headings and choose which section to go to or jump between sections based on their headings. Uh, but this only works if the headings on that page are real or what we call tagged headings. Okay, so to prep for this talk, I asked some of the people I work with um, how they add headings to content. And they're usually doing this, right? So you select the text, you bold it, increase the font size. But when you do that, you're creating uh, fake headings, right? So right concept, making it easier to see, but wrong execution. So bolding and changing the font size is not the same as adding a real heading. Uh, manually forwarded text like, formatted text like this does not offer an equivalent experience to a person using a screen reader. Uh, for example, if we're not using real headings, um, so if they're not tagged, and are instead just styling text to make it look like headings, uh, may not affect sighted users. They can still see the larger and bolded text and interpret them as headings, but the screen reader cannot. It just sees um, paragraphs, like this one on the right. So if we don't create real tag headings, we're denying some users the ability to take advantage of those visual cues offered by the headings which creates a worse experience and makes it much less likely that they're gonna notice the important content. So if bolding and changing the font size creates fake headings, how do you add real headings? Uh, fortunately, it's very easy. Uh, the specifics are gonna differ by the platform you're working in, but in virtually any text editor or word processing program, there's gonna be a dropdown or a button that lets you select a heading level. So these are some screenshots of those drop downs in different, uh, different platforms. Sometimes they're gonna call called styles or paragraph styles or format, but the option is always there. So your job is just to find it and start using it to add headings instead of bolding and changing the font size. And it's even fewer steps. So here we are on Canvas again. So selecting the text and then drop down, select the heading. Um, I chose heading level two here because the page title, which is exploring bacteria versus viruses, is heading one, and we add headings in order, uh, which plays into the next point. So when you're selecting headings, you want to choose the heading level that conveys an accurate hierarchy of information. I find it helps to think of your headings as a table of contents. And like I mentioned a little earlier, they are in fact, uh, for users of screen readers, they're a literal table of contents. The headings can be used to navigate the content of a page. And because of this, you wanna make sure your heading levels 
convey the correct relationship between sections and subsections. In other words, you want to make it clear what's part of what. So this is an example of what the headings might be in a syllabus. You can see the way they're visually styled is clear what the document is, the syllabus for HE366, and it's clear that each of the indented subsections is part of the item above it. Uh, for example, the learning outcomes are learning outcomes for this course, and it's clear that the quizzes, assignments, and final project are all assessments. We want the same hierarchy to be communicated to screen readers so they can create an accurate table of contents for users. And we do that by choosing the correct heading levels, like this. So we start with H1, or heading level one. That's the highest level heading. It describes the page as a whole. And generally speaking, a page should have only one heading one. Then we have H2, or heading level two, and H3, each representing increasing indentations um, in our conceptual outline here. If I were to have a heading underneath quizzes, for example, that was a subsection of quizzes, I would make that H4 or heading level four um, because we're going in sequential order, which brings me to the next point, which is use headings in sequential order. So another way you might put this is don't skip heading levels. When you skip heading levels, like the example on the left, that goes from heading level two to heading level four, it puts screen reader users in the confusing place of wondering if they somehow missed an important intermediate section. Instead, headings directly under the heading level two should be heading level three, like the one on the right. Then there's no confusion, everybody knows there's no uh, missing information. All right, next up, another common feature of documents and pages, um, lists. So just like your real headings, you wanna use real lists when you're listing items. So lists are great. They help us understand relationships and provide uh, some structure and order to content. When you have a set of information that's related in some way, for example, a set of weekly readings, Putting those items into a list, like the image on the right, is much easier for us to grasp quickly. We can see that those things are related. Assistive technology allows for similar scanning and navigation abilities, but only if the list is real or properly tagged. And when screen readers come to a tagged list, they'll notify the user that there's a list and how many items are in it. Uh, they can also tell users the relative position of each item in the list. And they also allow users to use uh, navigation commands like go to the next list item or go to next list. But again, this is only if it's a real list. So here's an example of a fake list and a real list. So a sighted user can tell the content on the left is a list by the visual formatting, though you still see some formatting errors, uh, such as the lack of text wrapping and um, inconsistent indentation. But it's not just formatting. When you create a fake list like this, you're diminishing the accessibility of the page. The screen reader will announce the items as unrelated paragraphs. It's not able to tell the user that this is a list or how many items are in it or which items are indented. It also announces the names of the symbol on each line. So for example, dash here, uh, which gets very annoying. And then the image on the right shows um, a properly formatted tag list. And it's not only accessible, it also looks a lot better. So if the dashes and numbers in front of paragraphs create fake lists, how do you add real lists? I'm guessing we all know how to do this or have done it, um, but are maybe just not in the habit of doing it. So just like adding the headings, the specifics are gonna differ a little bit by the platform, but again, the option is always there. The icons look like a bulleted list and a numbered list. So you just want to find that and start using it consistently. For example, here's a quick demo. We're in Moodle this time. Um, so select the text, click the numbered list, and then for the secondary one, I indent it. And this time I do bullets um, since the order on that subsection isn't important. So when to use numbers and when to use bullets. 
So like I just mentioned, you want to use numbered lists for steps and bulleted lists for related but not sequenced information. And that's because numbered lists imply steps that have a specific sequence. It's very easy to check if your information is sequenced or not. Just try rearranging the list in your head and see if it changes the meaning. If it does change the meaning, it should be an ordered or numbered list. Uh, for example, steps in an assignment that must be followed in a particular order. If when you rearrange the list items and the meaning does not change, then you want an unordered or bullet list. For example, if you have a list of discussion questions and students can choose which one to respond to. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about links. Okay, I won't say never, but generally speaking, you want to avoid pasting the full URLs for links. Full URLs are generally not easy to say, not pleasant to hear, and ugly to look at. And this is important because users of speech recognition technology can go to links by speaking the link text. Users of screen readers will hear the link text. And then many users are going to see the link text. So while this may not be an issue for very short, meaningful links, long links like this one here to a Google Doc is quite nasty. Um, don't do this to people. Instead of the full link, hyperlink text that tells you where the link goes, like this one on the right. Um, and this plays into the next point here, which is you want to write link text that makes sense out of context. If it's well written, the link text will help us quickly understand what happens when we click on the link without reading any of the surrounding text. And meaningful link text is especially important if you're trying to get somebody to do something when there's some kind of call to action, which generally is the reason that we're including the link in the first place. And I'll show you what I mean here. Uh, the block of text on the left is a snippet from an email I received the other day, and it ends with, you can submit questions here, and here is the link. And this is after, this is just a snippet, so this is after all sorts of other text in the email. So what are the chances that I'm going to read all that text? Not very likely. Uh, so the link needs to speak for itself. So instead of the cryptic here, uh, better link text would be submit questions for the town hall. This makes it clear what's going to happen when I click on that link. So don't make people work hard to do what you want them to do. Or maybe they don't actually want faculty to ask questions. That's possible. So there's another reason it's important to write meaningful link text, and that has to do with how users can use screen readers. So while screen readers can read a full page to a user, users may prefer to instead listen to a list of links. And in that case, a screen reader may only read the link text and not the surrounding text. So it's pretty easy to see why meaningful link text would be important in this context. For example, which list of links would be more useful in helping you understand the page and navigate? Probably not the one that just says video here, video here, example, example. A final tip related to links, uh, and that is to not underline non-link text. So links are conventionally underlined. So if we underline text that's not a link, it still looks like a clickable link, which is confusing when you click on it and then nothing happens. And for people who can't perceive the different color that links might be, then underlined text may literally look identical to a link. The solution here is simple. Uh, instead of underlining, use bolding. Unless it's a heading, then use a real heading. Thank you, Amy. That's great. So now we're going to talk about tables. Okay, starting with, you know, we've been using tables for all kinds of creative things <laughs> over time, but in general, tables should be used for data and not for layout. The reason why is because tables are more difficult to navigate than lists or other formatted content for people with disabilities. It takes a little extra amount of knowledge. So, if, so for example, does this content right here shown on this slide, does it need to be a table on the left? 
I've seen this commonly used on syllabi where you have instructor information in a little table so it looks nice and neat and stays in place but it is a little bit harder to navigate and there are no headers because it's a layout table so instead why not create a paragraph layout with a heading and if you're using multiple headings remember what Amy said use them in the correct order also tables should have defined headers well defined tables bring attention to items with headers to organize and understand content that's what they do that takes us to the next strategy uh, tables should have captions and identify which identify what the table use is what's the table doing in that context so let's we've been saying i've been saying you know headers and captions let's look at the parts of a table usually header rows at the top right and then the scope is raised columns because they head each column. And then header columns are usually on one side or the other. And then the scope is rows because they head each row, right? And the remainder of the table are usually cells where the content or the data will go. And of course, last but not least, table caption is very, very important because it provides a lot of information. So here's an example of a bad table. So this table appears to have headers, but these are fake headers, kind of like the fake headings that we heard of before. And how we know is when seen by, when read by a screen reader, it's going to start announcing and it's going to read everything left to right, top to bottom. And it's going to say table of three rows, it announced three columns, row one, column one product, column two price per pound, column three vegan, and then it will go into the next row and it will say row two and so forth. So it will continue going. In comparison, a better table with actual real heading headers will say not only what the table, how many rows and how many columns, but it will announce what it is for, taking that information from the caption. And then after announcing the first header row, every time it goes to a, a data or a cell row, it will say, for example, the one that says apples, it will say row two, product, column one, apples. Price per pound, column, 20.89. Vegan, column three, yes. So no matter where the person is on that table, they're gonna find and know what the relationship is with the headers and be able to identify the content. So, I mean, whether you're using Canvas or Moodle or you're doing web pages or you're using Word documents, I mean, they are, they are similar ways to add captions and headers to table. So in general, for let's say Canvas, for example, to add the headers of a table, you go to, um, you go to table properties first, and then there's an option for caption. So with that allows us to enter the caption and we just type it in and then highlight the, what is supposed to be the header row, and then go to table and cell properties, and select the cell type header cell and the scope column, and save. So that is, is, fairly, is fairly standard and is similar to other learning management systems. And this provides structure. So in Word, for example, the option to add a caption is in the right click menu insert caption and you enter it and you can edit the table one or whatever if you don't like it after it's inserted for the header you select the header go to table properties then to the row tab unselect the allow row to break and select repeat as header row and that's what it takes to make it a fully formatted table in word and it's going to be similar to other to Google Docs and some other some other ways. Google Docs is slightly different. It doesn't have as many features, but at least Microsoft Office, it is uh, fairly straightforward. So use simple tables. That's another recommendation. And that means without merge sales, whenever you can. And the reason for that is tables are already more difficult to navigate than other types of content. But when you have a merge sale, especially when there's no real needed functionality, 
it disorients the people navigating the table who cannot see it. So one thing that's seen commonly done is a title for a table or some sort of category that could just be text outside. It could be a caption. It's inserted in a merge cell because it looks nice. So let's remember to have well-formatted tables so they work well for everyone. Okay. Now back to Amy. Back to me. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about color. So first, don't use color alone to convey meaning. It's really easy to make this mistake when you're creating legends and keys for things like tables, uh, graphs, and charts. But using only color to distinguish information is a problem. Uh, not everyone can perceive color. Some people with color deficits have trouble differentiating between specific colors, such as red and green. Um, screen readers uh, also do not announce color, so then the user is not able to access the meaning that you're trying to convey. For example, here's a table that's a project outline. So some of the weeks are identified by red text, and the key here on the left is that red text means there's other assignments due that week. But for someone who can't perceive color, that meaning literally disappears. I mean, it's a, it's a slightly darker black, but essentially it's impossible to tell what this key is referring to. So color can be a, a really good way to present information, but you just wanna make sure that there's other ways to get that information. And the easiest ways are to add text, uh, symbols, or patterns to distinguish uh, information conveyed by color. For example, if we add an asterisk to the project timeline from before, even if you don't see the red, you're still able to tell what this key is referring to and what weeks are going to have other assignments due. So next, you wanna make sure that there's enough contrast between your text and the background. The reason here is pretty simple. Uh, text that's too similar to the background color is hard to read. So poor contrast is a common trap that people fall into when they choose themes and templates. For example, here are some slides with poor contrast. So the left two are from PowerPoint, themes which in my opinion, at least the top one, should just be deleted entirely from their repository, but they're there and people use them. Uh, and then the two on the right from Canva. I love Canva, but you've got to watch out for the hard to read color combos. Instead, look for designs that generally have a light background and dark text like these two PowerPoint slides on the left. And then if you're using a dark background and light text, like the flyer in the center from Canva, uh, make sure the text is big, not a fancy font like the one before, and that there's not too much text. You can always add uh, splashes of color like the infographic example on the right with the orange headings. All right, on it. <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about scan pages. Since uh, we use those a lot, a lot of times we use them because we want to help students save money because there's a chapter of this wonderful book and they do not need to buy the whole book or something is out of print. So there are certain uses for scans. So if we use those, let's make sure we create high quality scans. So that means that uh, they should be text-based, they should be clear. So they're more usable by everyone, including people with disabilities. Here's an example of bad scans. Uh, text is cut off, it's got dark gutters, poor contrast blurring. Sometimes you have crooked or rotated pages, uh, handwriting marks, uh, stains, or even have multiple print pages on each electronic page or Rotate it. <laughs> so let's look at a good, a better scan or a good scan. Okay. This, this portion shows that it has shows clear text. It's easy to read, good contrast, the pages and the text is straight, no writing marks, no stains, and one print page per electronic page. 
So some things to do before scanning with a scanner is to set the dots per inch or DPI between 300 and 400 minimum. If you can do 600, it's even better. Uh, always scan as black and white, or if it's color, set it to 24 bit for higher quality. Also, if it's possible, turn on the optical character recognition or OCR, because this creates a scan that is text-based and searchable. So it will be a little bit more accessible and it will not be an image PDF. So once you have created the PDF, I mentioned before that PDFs are, are not as accessible as other types of documents. You can open it in software such as Adobe Acrobat DC, where you can, the reading order can be checked, make sure that the, lot, the way it reads is how it's expected in the same order. And also tags can be added, creating a tag PDF. This means that it's going to add little bits of information that identify the headings in the PDF, tables, alt text, uh, paragraph text, and lists. There's also the types of media that we use, right? So let's take a look at some other media. One good strategy is to provide alternate forms of representation for media. And the reason why is because alternate formats provide students with choices and flexibility. We may have busy students, we may have students who prefer to look at content differently, absorb it differently, or maybe they have a disability. So for, for students with disability, it provides equal access to the content. Captions and transcripts help everyone, people with disabilities, those um, who want, oh, typo, who want to read and listen at the same time. And research has shown, by the way, that that enhances learning. Also, it helps ESL learners and many others. Other types of media are videos. Some common uh, tools for video streaming are YouTube or Panopto, and there are ways to add captions to your own videos. In YouTube, you, can, you get three basic options. You can edit the automatic captions that it produces, you can add your transcript and then sync it to the timings, or you can upload a caption file. In Panopto, it has an option to import the automatic speech recognition that's built in, and then if you, when you bring it in, you edit the errors and the typos, then you make it so it's accurate and accessible. Some other options that we become very, very familiar with, Zoom, <laughs> because we've been doing a lot of Zooming and Zoom recordings. Um, there is an option that Zoom has to create an, an automatic transcript, but it's only available for cloud recordings. Uh, once this is done, if you, uh, if you enable the automatic transcript in your account, you're able to download a file that has a little extension of VTT, and it is a captions file that can be uploaded to like YouTube, for example, or you can also use it as a transcript and remove the, uh, the timings off of it. In Canvas, uh, you could embed an uploaded video. It has to be a video that you upload directly to the Canvas environment. And then once it's uploaded and saved in the player, you can locate the captions button. And from there, select the upload captions option. From there, you can either upload a captions file like a VTT or, or some other format, or you can, it will, can take you also to a subtitles creation tool where you can enter the captions. The library offers amazing types of media. They have tons of media collections that a lot of times we forget that we have available. And librarians are so excited and always ready to help to find content. A lot of this content is already captioned or transcribed, so think about that. Some databases, examples of, of, of video, streaming video, Films on Demand, Canopy, or PBS. One cool thing about Canopy is that if you find videos that are not captioned, they can be submitted for captioning. It does take a couple of weeks for the captioning to show up, but it's part of the subscription. 
there are places, uh, sites with high quality podcasts that are already captioned or, or transcribed like NPR or National Geographic, for example. In terms of another type of media is images. Images are amazing. They can, they can communicate visually so many ideas and do it so well, provide an alternate way of teaching and, and clarifying, communicating concepts, right? But images should also have alternate text, which is you know, the alternate format if you cannot quite see the image or perhaps the image gets blocked, right? An alt text or alternate text should always describe the function, the function of the image in that specific context. And um, if the image is decorative, that is absolutely fine. We want to create wonderful content that is visually appealing where people, people want to be there and people want to consume it. So mark it as decorative in those cases. When you add alt text, refrain from using things like image of, picture of, because this is already announced by assistive technologies, so it's not necessary. And, and one thing to remember is keep all text to less than 240 characters. So think of a tweet in a way. <laughs> okay, so here's a way how to add alt text to an office document. Right click on the image and select the edit alt text. And the newer version of office has just a nice area where you can enter your all text and it also offers a little box to mark as decorative so it made it really really easy to add alt text or do the decorative option in canvas it's really easy as well if you click on the image options for the image you can enter the alt text or you can mark as decorative it's a little checkbox checkbox too if that's the case just remember add alt text that describes the meaning of that image in that context. That's the most important part. Here's an example of an infographic. Infographics are wonderful, but so if someone cannot see or cannot see it very well, it takes, you know, it doesn't provide the same experience. So, I mean, even though it's wonderful, we should also make available a text option like this example. This is from Western Washington University, and they offer a text version of that. And in the slides, there's a link for the live version of the infographic and the text version of, of the infographic. So it is possible. <laughs> Here's an image with a caption. And this is another way that you can provide a text equivalent to the image that is right for someone who cannot see it as well, uh, or perhaps they're just listening to the content and then it can read that to them. Okay, back to Emmy. <laughs> so um, we have an actual playbook. Uh, the link here is on the slides. Open it up. So it's basically just expanded notes on what we talked about. Um, very informal, but just some tips, some links, um, examples, and then also down here at the bottom, in case you want even more information, is that um, some additional resources. So there's a lot of information out there on accessibility. These are some of the ones that uh, we think are the most helpful. Uh, links right there, and then accessibility checkers. Um, it's good to not have to rely on these entirely, but it can help you check things. And especially if you're pretty new to accessibility, using one of these checkers and just getting used to what is being marked incorrectly is going to help you a lot. So that's in the slide notes, and probably somebody's putting it in the chat, I would imagine. Um, yeah, we just wanted to give that to you. All right, look at that. Ended slightly early. Um, so now let's answer some questions. There we go. <laughs> oh, actually, um, Amy, as you are on this note, there was a question in the chat just sent in. Could you please um, post in the chat for the, the link for the playbook? 
Thank you. And Anna, there's a question in the QA uh, specific to the alt text and would the Microsoft PowerPoint slide be a replacement or supplement to it? Okay, so the question says, uh, would using the notes section of the Microsoft PowerPoint slide be a replacement or a supplement to alt text? Will screen reader read the notes section of, of the PowerPoint slide? So, um, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what technology they're using. If they're using a screen reader uh, such as JAWS and they've set it up to read the notes, it will pick them up. Uh, NVDA, it may or may not, depending on the settings. That's another screen reader that is free. Um, and uh, the voiceover, which is a, a speech to text, almost a screen, full screen reader, not quite, uh, that is free with Macs. Uh, depending on how I set up, it may see some, but for the most part, if it's a presentation mode, it will miss it. So having said that, don't count on the notes to provide the alternate text. Have the notes and the speaker notes, that's absolutely fine, provide them. But for any images, do provide alternate text, especially if they're complex images. So it looks like another, so another, questions. An, another question was, should we avoid fancy text in general? I would say, yeah, stick to a, uh, they say sans serif. Um, so like Caligri Arial is, is easy to read on a screen. Um, and then serif times your Roman uh, for things that are printed out. But yeah, generally avoid those scripty handwriting, especially if it's more than a couple words, it just is taxing. <laughs> So I have a question. So Kathleen asked a question about scope and I don't really understand what scope is. And she was, it, it was answered in regards to Word documents. And then also apparently you can define it in Canvas, which is what she was interested in. Scope and tables, I think is what it was related to. Right, right. Yeah, the scope, um, the scope is basically what the header is affecting or is leading or is or is uh, linking the content that it has it could be the scope can be column scope if you have a header row because each column the top of each column is going to have a header or thank you Amy uh, or if it's a, a header uh, column then the scope will be rows because it heads each individual row so that's the at the most basic level, what the scope means. So you find it in some tools, not all the tools ask you to define the scope, but uh, the scope is just what is, what is linked to, what is related to, okay? What is, what is connecting to directly. Uh, another place that you see it often is, I've done a lot of uh, PDF remediation using Acrobat, Adobe Acrobat DC. And when doing remediation, uh, and making the table accessible in a PDF, one of the things they have, that I have to do is tell it what the scope is. So I have to look and see what type of table it is and if it is a header row or a column row. And in some cases, and you may have seen tables, that you may have both scopes. So you have to assign the both option. That's usually available as well as in Canvas. Um, did that clarify that? I think so. Makes makes more sense. Makes a little bit more sense now. Yeah. Um, actually, I just enabled microphone for everybody. So you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to um, ask questions using audio if you prefer. And Stephanie, I saw your hand. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, you're not unmuted. We see your picture, but not. 
but it's uh, muted still. I can unmute you too, Stephanie. Let me try this. Huh? Doesn't like it. Well, that's happening. Uh, there is a question about animation in a PowerPoint be used to at a minimum. Good animation. Um, definitely for when you're sharing like your slide deck, I would turn off all animations. When you're presenting, the ones that are really fancy, like spiraling and zooming and bouncing, yeah, I wouldn't use those. But a fade, um, you know, some of those smoother transition, like the ones that we had in these slides, um, that would be fine. Yes, and uh, and so going along with that, the recommended animations they should always always move with it with click, mm -hmm. with an X click instead of uh, being timed. That will make the if you're sharing your presentation will make it more accessible. So Kathleen asks, asks I'm curious, what is the difference be between a header column and a header row? How does the screen reader read each? Yeah, so the difference is a header column is usually on one side or the other, and it has a, a, and it connects with uh, the information on that row. And a, a, a header row is usually at the top, and it connects every all of the columns that are that are below, the information that is below. So, for example, like the one the picture that we have uh, of this slide, right? So. The header row says aisle, product, price per pound, and vegan, but e and each one of those, so the aisles, one, three, two, product, apples, goat cheese, walnuts. So if I am in a sale that says $4.99, for example, and is properly formatted, so the headers have been identified, it will say that price per pound, okay, of the column three, in header three is four ninety nine, and it will identify it that way, so people that can be helpful. there and yeah, like like we did with a screen reader demonstration here, it will announce what uh, what is related to the four ninety nine. It will it will be connected to the price per pound, and it will be announced, so the person knows what that is. So I have a comment. Can I make that and then you can respond? This is Jerry. So um, in my opinion, 600 pixels per inch PPI or people say DPI for scanning is too high generally, although for a, for a, a black and white document as opposed to a grayscale, that might be fine. It's probably preferred, mm -hmm. but 300 should be adequate for a grayscale. Mm -hmm. um, and when I scan, I use, I just scan directly using Adobe DC and I have the check to produce uh, a uh, OCR version. And I think that's probably preferable. I mean, I don't think anybody should be putting up just straight scans because they're just inaccessible. Uh, although if you are running Canvas and you have Ally, it does, it does automatically produce an OCR version, but it does mean that the student has to, has to know about the drop down and so on. Th those are kind of my opinions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, the, the higher you go on the DPI, it will be a larger file size. So it's something that, that's why the at minimum it should be three to 400. So 300 files in that. So you have plenty of clarity, uh, but look at your content. You may need to go a little bit higher um, in, if it's black and white and you go 600, just like you said, Jerry, it will definitely be a smaller file size than if you go grayscale or color. So, and those are choices, you, you know, you can make in, in, uh, Acrobat DC too. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. And, and actually, so just a straight scan, Acrobat DC, uh, does a lot better compression than straight image scan scans too. So, you know, it's like, for example, I scanned a, a page at 300 PPI and, and it was, I think it was in color, it was like multiple 
tens of is like 27 megabytes or something. And the, the, I didn't look at the DC file, but I'm sure it was quite a bit smaller. So it, 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 it's fairly intelligent about its compression um, without sacrificing a lot of quality. Right. I mean, so these settings Adobe then Adobe. are on the scanner, right? Like the DPI. The, like uh, gen the generally, they're in the software, software that you're using. I mean, you might be able to do quick scans by setting them on the scanner, but generally speaking, Acrobat DC, you have settings that that you can where you set the the resolution and other factors. Correct, correct. So, so yeah, just to clarify, so this when I said, when I mentioned the scanner, I was referring to software. So this, if you don't have Adobe Acrobat, then the software that the scanner came with, that's where you would set this, uh, apply the settings. And I see another question in the Q&A from Teresa. The name of the screen reader that's free for Mac users. So it's included with the Mac operating system and it's called VoiceOver. And you can find it in the, in the system under accessibility and the system settings. And it comes with a tutorial and a practice uh, area where you can learn how to use it. And Anna, I have a question related to a comment you made earlier. Um, so you mentioned that um, fixing the PDF to make them more accessible and there had been a lot of issues. So what are the most commonly seen issues that in your experience you've seen um, in, in PDFs? And if I imagine all of us have a ton of PDFs, if we want mm -hmm. to check accessibility and make improvements, where do we start? What are the low hanging fruits that we can, we can do? Right, right. Thank you. Um, yes. So most common things I've seen, uh, bad scans. Uh, <laughs> so they're difficult to read for anyone, right? Um, also PDFs that are image PDFs, so they're not accessible. You cannot select text. Uh, no assistive technology can access. It has to be converted to text. Um, another very common one is the reading order. One thing that happens a lot of times, and it depends on the quality, depends on the process, there are a lot of factors that affect this, but PDFs a lot of times have a, end up having a very out of order reading order. So you see it and you expect to read, oh, this will read top to bottom, left to right, right as we all read. But sometimes in the process of the PDF creation, things get messed up and then it starts jumping around. It may start in the middle of the page and jump to the top and jump to the next page, maybe the end and back to the middle of another page. So that's one thing that needs to be checked when making PDFs accessible and that's what's called remediation. Um, and in terms of low hanging fruit, um, so if you follow you know, a lot of the, the this strategies that we share, you know, things that Amy talked about, headings and uh, well, doing the good scans, definitely, right? But using, using well-formatted documents in Microsoft Word, right? So using headings, real lists, formatted tables. So make sure that the document you start with is well-formatted and is accessible. And then you do a save as PDF and make sure that the tags for accessibility option is checked when you're saving it. So those tags, that information gets transferred to the PDF. So that's a very low hanging fruit. And having said that, if you have the choice of sharing a PDF or a Word doc or an Office document, an Office document will always be more accessible than the PDF. And if you have, if there's, and if you want, don't want to share that office document that's editable and you want to make it more static, you can always put the content directly on a web page or, learn, or a learning management system page. And then that will be static content and well, people Google can Docs. print it. <laughs> Google Docs, yeah, make it turn off editor oh. access and then, yeah. Thank you. 
And I, before we close, we have three minutes left. I'm just watching the clock. Did we miss any questions? Anything left in the Q&A that have not been addressed? I just want to make sure that all questions are answered. So I see a question. Somebody asked if there was a way, a difference between uh, Adobe Acrobat DC and Abbey Fine Reader. That's, that's used a lot in libraries to digitize content. Um, yes, there is a difference. Abbey Fine Reader is a conversion tool uh, to digitize content, text content, and it's different than Adobe. Adobe is a standard and well-known uh, PDF creation and editing tool. Um, and Abbey Fine Reader uh, can be used to remediate or make PDFs accessible. And plus it has other functionality. Great, thank you. We are almost at the hour. Any last comments and questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Amy and Anna, and this is very helpful and timely information, um, especially as schools are doing more and more online and remote instructions. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or if there's anything we missed in the chat or the Q&A, please feel free to reach out and we'll follow up with you. Okay, uh, we'll say bye for now and we'll see you in some other sessions. Bye. Bye. Hi, thanks.